So from the people who are actually working on isolated bits of, of, um, of research, there is a keen interest to say, what's the global agenda? And so that, that also helps to frame individual pieces of really valuable work. And we also have from uh, our side, I have a verbal agreement to co-fund and co-host, um, if, that's, you know, if, that's, if, that's, if you're willing to do that, a, the, a workshop like that from, uh, from our side. Um, so, you know, we fully endorse it and are happy to provide um, support and develop the content and the agenda. Hi, yes, this is Arnon O'Cleary here from Irish Aid. Um, I just um, wanted to make a, a few comments ar around the presentation, if I might. Um, and thanks very much, Jim, for um, uh, an excellent presentation. I thought the, uh, at the very beginning you talked about um, how these approaches to uh, inclusive uh, agribusiness uh, need to be specifically designed uh, to, to build inclusion and that it isn't just about linking farmers to markets. The point I really wanted to make is that there's, I think in this agenda there's kind of a, a, um, a, a danger of assuming a very broad consensus uh, around approaches which perhaps isn't really there. Uh, and I think particularly when you when you did the when you showed the maps the, uh, of all of the all of the all everything that's going on and all the entities and, uh, uh, that are involved and when you spoke about it being in the billions um of uh, presumably of dollars uh, of support that's going into this sort of work i think you you're you're kind of looking at a universe of engagement in um private engagement with private investment in agriculture that uh, is a very broad church and which I would say is not necessarily identifiable as promoting uh, inclusion necessarily. Um, with with our, our, our work in, in, in this area is very much at, at country level and what we would see um, is certainly the need for specific design uh, and to be quite clear about what you want to achieve. And I think there's a tendency for fairly fundamental differences of policy approach uh, to be masked by the kind of, um, uh, by, the, by the language we tend to use and, and rather ill-defined uh, concepts. So, you know, there, there would be differences, um, uh, say, between, between donors and governments over what actually, you know, what, what constitutes inclusive economic policies, uh, what are the, the models for economic development that governments might have, and ha how, how inclusive they are. And, of course, there's differences among, between donors on, on those issues as well. So, you know, in, in our, our attempts to kind of um, uh, build a consensus among, um, say, our funding partners and with governments, um, it's quite difficult to have um, what an agreed concept of inclusion is um, or what um, um, uh, inclusive agribusiness uh, might mean. You know, who are the target groups? What are the types of results and impacts you want? achieve for them, what are the specific parts of the private sector uh, that, are, that are important uh, to work with and to support, uh, and what, what, what value chains um, uh, are, are, are the critical ones. See, I, I was interested in what you said about the difference between looking at agribusiness and looking at value chains, but if you're looking from an inclusion analysis, you know, including large numbers of poor people in the economy and in the economic opportunity. Well, actually, there are very specific value chains in which poor people are involved. Uh, and so, you know, I think we'd certainly question the idea of, uh, you know, that you can take a, um, a sort of a, a generic approach to business uh, and hope to achieve inclusion through that. I think that the um, it's quite a segmented thing, segmented in terms of value change, segmented in terms of the different sorts of uh, private sector actors that need to be supported. Uh, and their interests and the sort of facilitating and supporting environment they need are not the same 
I, I'm, I would say. So anyway, sorry, I don't want to go on too much, but really I'm just saying that I think in, it would be very useful to do some good conceptual work on what, uh, developing what an agreed uh, concept of, of inclusive agribusiness is. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head with a lot of those comments. Um, and I think one of the things we need to realise is huge ideological differences about which ways you go. We don't have the, the sort of synthetic evidence that enables us to have a very deep discussion about any of this. Um, so, you know, you've got lots of individual program evaluations and lots of individual case studies and lots of good practice guidelines and so on, but none of that's really giving us a very sensible um, big picture perspective of what all that might mean from a more strategic policy perspective. Well, um, I think there's a kind of, uh, speaking from our <laughs> experience within our own organization as well, you know, when you go down the best practice route, you know, of kind of identifying the best practice and building evidence from it, the assumption, of course, is that there is Best practice and evidence, and that you will, and and that you will be able to to sift it from everything else. Whereas the tendency tends to be that everybody, once that starts, everybody starts putting forward whatever they're doing as being the best practice and uh, trying to trying to demonstrate evidence of it. Of course, I agree that there's um, uh, that there there are some there are some things out there, but. There are there are risks as well with going down the the best practice route. I think some you know clear work on on concept and on who actually you're delivering for and what you're trying to what you're trying to deliver for, um, is it would be a very useful starting point. Then you can look at you you have something to kind of um, uh, test your your uh, experience and evidence against. I've I've now got the name of the report. Of course, it's the high school report. And the sort of thing that that showed up, which I thought was really interesting, was basically saying the biggest economic benefit for farmers actually came from um, production increases. Yet, the, by implication of that, though, is if you don't have the market, then there's nothing to drive the production increases. So there was a really interesting analysis in that report about what sorts of benefits had accrued at what levels across a whole range of case studies. And I think some of that sort of work could give us a much better insight into, into what's going on. So I'd, I'd, I'd highly recommend that report for people to have a bit of a look at if you're interested, and it's referenced in, the, in my report. Dr. Pepe, thanks for the, the link to the report. Um, we'll have a look at that. And um, I think we would be interested yet also in participating and maybe helping a bit with uh, the organization and discussion on, on, the, on the, an event in November or later if we need. I think that one of the constraints for us would be that it would be great if we could identify opportunities and, and join that with other events that are scheduled. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but I think that would help us. Uh, yeah, I think the agenda is, is obviously for us as, us, as others, uh, the evidence, the agenda on the evidence is critical and really important. Uh, what constitutes inclusive? Are we really measuring that in our programs? I'm, I'm not sure, and how. Um, and and those about the new financial instruments, but uh, what goes together with that for us as well is, as we're developing new financial instruments, uh, the first thing for us is to make sure we have the, the pipelines of investable investments that are there and available, and lots of, lots of the time, actually, the, the bottleneck may well be uh, the the existence, the, possi the possibility of, of projects and investments that are, that are bankable and, and uh, that we can finance for, for our innovative schools. So, so we also very much want to learn about how, what are the, the complementary approaches working directly with the private sector with finance that, that will help us grow this pipeline uh, so that includes obviously the policy instruments that may uh, well include uh, lots of other aspects and types of interventions that could work. And, it reminded me, just to add the agenda you proposed, reminded me that the EU uh, work group, uh, the HAS, the Heads of Agriculture and World Development, um, had a, a sub-working group working on the private sector in agriculture, and I think I have never seen uh, the outcome of this work group, and I don't know what has worked or what has <coughs> to learn from, from that one as well to, to, to make sure that the way we, we, we drive the group makes it uh, successful. 
um, maybe just to add on to that, Emmanuel, I mean, there has been some discuss discussion of whether the EU group and the um, donor platform group might somehow sort of become combined. I think that's early early discussions, but that that if that idea has been raised. No, I mean, um, you, you, Ria, you might um, you might want to add on it. I think uh, there there were some um, thoughts and and ideas how to better link or work together or um, combine the private sector development. Um, group here in Brussels with the inclusive agribusiness group uh, of the donor platform, but I think there, there there's no, I think that's something which uh, is a decision to be taken by the, by the commission and by DEFCO, and uh, we had some, some talks with Alois, who, uh, who was, um, running or is running this PSDA group, but I understand that he's uh, leaving towards Zambia soon. So I think there is an option, but I think that's a, a decision to be, be taken and by, by DEFCO. So I, we, had, we had some ideas and, and talks about it here, but there's no nothing uh, decided yet on this. And it's also not on on me to do so. It's I'm. Uh, I think that's um, because the, the driver of this group has always been Defco itself, and um, we were engaged and, and supportive. And um, but I think it's an opportunity which we could further explore. So yeah, my first question. I think you were discussing about that because I couldn't hear uh, quite well. But it was about. Uh, these two different working groups, the private sector and trade uh, working group and this new inclusive agribusiness working group, whether they were going to merge or work together. And the second question um, was also built from a previous intervention. It was about uh, this uh, inclusivity factor, uh, especially uh, when we're talking about agribusiness and this uh, linking uh, farmers to market uh, approach. Uh, there's a very important, I think it was mentioned in the presentation, but maybe it was uh, a bit quick, the question of informality. Uh, I work a lot in West Africa on value chains, on uh, food value chains, and uh, when we're talking about getting the products to the market, there's a a lot of uh, informal dynamics going on that are, uh, in fact, very inclusive because they engage a lot of people. And when we talk about the uh, programs, for instance, uh, trying to move from informal economies to formal economies, trying to formalize value chains, I wonder how inclusivity can be addressed when what we will uh, uh, do is uh, actually get a lot of people out of these value chains, but moving towards a more for, more for, formal economy. So I don't know if uh, whether this uh, uh, informality issue uh, that is uh, very linked to the inclusivity issue, uh, whether this could be maybe developed. I don't know if uh, you did more, more research on that. And this, of course, comes back to the poor people, the segmented, the approaches, everything that was raised in, in the previous intervention about targeting groups, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Jim, I will pass you to maybe already respond on the second question, and then I can make a few comments regarding the merge, the possible merge of the two work streams of the platform. Please go ahead. Oh, I think as I, I highlighted, I think that's a critically important question. I think where we're sometimes a bit naive is I suspect that there's much more interlinkages between formal, informal, large-scale business, small-scale business, and all sorts of linkages, and understanding how all of those linkages are working and what that means for where you intervene, I think is one of the, the important knowledge and, and learning and defining defining questions. Uh, Rami, I, I was also keen to... Hi, David. Uh, Dave Nevin. I was also keen to get a bit of a perspective from David, if you don't mind, because you've, of course, been doing a lot of work in this space and... Um, of course, as you'll see, I've stolen one of your diagrams in, in my report, which I thought was extremely helpful in, in trying to unpack some of the linkages. But you might have some views on this sort of discussion of value chain versus inclusive business be helpful for us. David Nevin from FBO. Um, I'm, I'm part of FBO's um, strategic program on inclusive and efficient food systems. 
Um, well, thanks Jim, for the, the presentation. I think it puts all the issues, um, you know, very clearly on on the table. I, I I I keep wondering about this 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 element of okay, we want uh, value chains to be inclusive, but people are are uh, included in the value chains or the food system or the the, the functioning, the performance of the agribusinesses in in various ways, right? They they may uh, supply the the business, they may um, at the same time derive some income from working in the business, they may at the same time get healthier or cheaper food from that business. So so the the inclusiveness even for the same person can be along various dimensions. And also wondering when you have um, when you look at the the number the great number of people who are involved in ag- in agriculture in the agri agri food system and production and trade and so on. A lot of of their involvement are survival strategies, right? They they are producing something because there are no jobs available. There's no alternative outcomes, and so I think we we need to reflect a little bit also on what we could maybe call the absorptive capacity of the food system in terms of of providing everybody derives their food from it. But other than that, in terms of economic terms, in terms of um, you know, yeah, I, I don't see I don't see it as a realistic strategy that we look at all the smallholder farmers even the, the poorest assistance farmers, and see how we can include them in, in the food system, in the value chain. So part of what was said before, okay, we go from informal to formal, some may drop out, and there's some, some risk, but I think we have to take into account, or we have to see how, how inclusive can the food system be. It's, it's, I mean, we have to look not just at jobs that are being created, but also the quality of the and who gets the jobs, obviously, but also the quality of the jobs. And we want the quality of those jobs to be better, right? The people drive a, um, a higher income from, from those jobs, which, which means they have to be, as an individual, more productive. They have to be maybe a bit more capitalized in, in what they're doing, which means one person can do the work of several others. So we have to see, differentiate between social support strategies, the poor who are in agriculture because they have no way out and need to, to be supported into jobs, and the number of people we can include as workers, as farmers, um, as entrepreneurs in the um, in the in the food system, so I, I think the metrics that you put first are are very important, and they're linked to the concept, right? How we see this this the role of agri business will will help us determine what we need to measure, and and what to measure, and then the, the even more difficult question, how to measure it, um, are are very critical. As long as we don't have that, we're sort of we don't know if what we're doing has any impact. So I'm I'm very happy you put that as a first element on your your last slide. But but the other thing I want to say is like, what's the absorptive capacity of the food system? I, I think we have to differentiate between those who are in the uh, the food system as as pure a survival strategy and those who are in the food system in terms of of deriving a commercial income from it, who really want to grow, and others who want to escape it for a better opportunity, which needs a different strategy. I mean, I think that's a really important point, and that comes to a distinction that I made in one part of the, the draft report which was between strategic questions and operational questions. So I think there are some big strategic questions which you and others have raised in the discussion this afternoon. And then there's, of course, a whole lot of more operational questions. Once a business wants to work with small-scale farmers or uh, work with micro-enterprises in the value chain, how does it do it? If a business wants to uh, adopt um, responsible investment principles, how does it do it? So I think that it's useful for us at the moment to sort of make this distinction between the operational side and the and the bigger strategic questions. Um, just to come back to Carmen's question uh, about the merge, the possible merge of the two work streams of the Donald platform. So for those of you who are not uh, aware, we have also another work stream in the platform called Trade for ARD, so for Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, and now we have this emerging work stream on inclusive agribusiness. There have been a lot of talks on um, how closely linked they are, these two work streams, so also on the possibility for a merge. However, we have seen uh, um, in this past year the way that the two work streams have been developing. Uh, On one hand, uh, they are very much linked, but on the other, we see also a number of people who are relatively different engaging in each of these work streams. And also, it's quite a lot of people in the different work streams. So it would probably make a far too big group to manage to to be uh, effective at the end. 
Uh, and we, what, we, what we have decided so far is that we want to concretely establish a few uh, occasions in the year where the two groups who have an opportunity uh, to exchange ideas or to meet. Uh, so we keep the two groups sort of well informed about each other. So for the moment, uh, we, we are still with the idea of keeping the two groups separately, but again, very uh, linked to each other. Simon Hess uh, with the Enhanced Integrated Framework Secretariat. Um, thanks for, for that update. I was at the, the last meeting um, of the, the trade group, um, and I think um, some of the, dis well, obviously the discussion in the meeting um, had a lot of interest in ensuring close linkages between the, the two work streams. Um, however, I think from, from our side, it would probably be um, good to keep, to keep the option open of possibly having a, a merge um, in, in the next year. I think that there's an, a lot of overlap between the, um, between the two work streams. Thank you, Simon. We'll definitely uh, consider your comment and keep the option open. Of course, it's, uh, it, it's, the whole thing is driven by members and what they think would be best. Um, we'll follow up on these conversations, that's for sure. So I would then share with you a, a, a tentative calendar for the next webinars the, or conference calls that we'd like to organize and a bit of the ideas uh, in each of these calls that we want to, to discuss. Thank you very much all for joining. I hope to keep hearing from you.